This is the Page Publishing Book Club. Good evening. How you doing? I'm your host, Alice Stackton Rossini. Rob Barrett's is my engineer, and we're back and ready for action. Your action. Come on now, we need guests for this show. Write that book, sign up for an interview, but first, check out what other first-time authors are doing. Find out how they got through the trials and tribulations of getting the job done. And hear from successful authors and find out why they're successful. L.P. Bresney is a great example of that. He's a rifleman. He tests and evaluates all kinds of ammo, all kinds of rifles, and writes about his findings. Right off the bat, he's got a special audience, gun lovers. And now, I might add, he's got a new publisher, Paige. He switched to us because he couldn't say what he wanted to say the way he wanted to say it at his previous publisher. So, long story short, give us the story behind your book, Rifleman's Toolbox. Um... This book is the culmination of actually book three. Uh, I wrote two uh, other folks, and then uh, this one I went with you folks and decided to put together myself because I had things I wanted to say that weren't getting said, and they they really came together nicely. I'm very, very pleased with it. The other books, you were edited? You weren't allowed to say certain things? Uh, Yeah, I I, I would just leave brands out. But uh, for the most part, uh, editors had their ideas, and and, uh, there was a lot of heavy editing. And it's not that the main points didn't get across, but it wasn't to the way that I would normally present it. So when I went with page publishing, page publishing, it was... uh, uh, it was, you know, my, my my material all the way across, and that's really how I wanted it. So you're honest about the products that you test? Yeah, dead honest, absolutely. But that's a piece of it. So is this like a book where I can, you know, if I buy a certain kind of rifle, I can look it up in your book and and know what to expect from this product? You can, you, you'll know what to expect in terms of that, type of rifle, not necessarily a specific brand name, okay. but you'll know what, what this is going to do. And what the book is, is about is a step-by-step advancement and learning how to shoot at long range. This is this is a big thing today since, uh, since Afghanistan and Iraq and, and some of the issues back all the way toward Desert Storm. Um, uh, we've got a lot of young men that came back here with these skills, and uh, it's kind of developed kind of into its own for lack of a better term, uh, it's, a, it's its own game of golf, so it's got, you know, it's uh, long-range shooting, and most of it is on steel, most of it is on target, some of it is, has bled over into the game area, but for the most part, it's uh, it's, a, it's just a long-range perfecting the skill and, and taking up the challenge of hitting something out there in the next zip code. I'm, I'm sitting here wondering why why you would need that skill, I'm just for the fun of it. That's exactly what it is. You know, I, I have had, you know, people ask this question uh, repeatedly. Why on earth would anybody want to hit anything at uh, 1,000 yards, 1,600 yards, one mile, two miles? I'm not exaggerating on ranges either. And the, the thing is, is because it's there, I guess, you know. Uh, why does anybody want to try to drive a hole in one with the odds of probably never getting one in a lifetime? It's because it's there. And, it, and it's becoming very, very popular. Uh, not just here out in the wide open west, but there are ranges being developed for, you know, like thousand yard shooting back east. Uh, I shot some out there in uh, in Illinois, for example, which is pretty heavy congestion on population, but they found a way to work it out safely with correct berms and, and the proper landscaping, et cetera. So this is becoming a very popular sport. Yes, ma'am. It is, most definitely. Now, since you're, are you kind, are you kind of known for writing about, you know, rifles and guns and things? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that is that is that has been my genre for almost forty years. Forty years. Yeah. So, are you selling yeah. this book? I mean, are people looking forward to this book? Well, I hope so. That's kind of what it's about. I, I, I'm I, I'm not doing it as a vanity kind of a thing. Uh, uh, I really was just looking for a source to get this material out. Uh, I travel around a little bit, uh, go to some, uh, uh, like the National Shot Show, NRA shows, et cetera, et cetera, and, and I will, uh, you know, I will have this at hand. 
so far, even locally here, yes, I'm, I'm quite surprised. Well, again, it helps that you have a very specific audience. All right, LP, thanks very much. Myrna Loy Griffith is a native New Yorker. She's from right over the bridge here in Queens. She decided to write about her life experiences. Her book entitled, And All the Time I Loved God, has been in the making for how long, Myrna? Good grief. You know what? Um, I retired at the age of 62, and... I'm on my way to being 80 years old in a couple of months, wow. August. Yeah. I was bored as heck, and I said, what am I going to do? And then something just said, write your autobiography. And uh, so I just started writing a longhand. You know, I didn't type it or anything. I was writing it out. And, boy, I'm telling you, I was just writing, 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 like, nonstop. I was excited. And I said, wow, this is great. I'm talking to myself, you know, while I'm writing. And um, after I got halfway through, I said, there's some good stuff in here. This this book needs to be published. This is serious. This is some lessons for the women to learn, the young women. And then my daughter died. Oh, I'm and, sorry. Yeah, my daughter died, and that just stopped me in my tracks. I had three grandsons to raise when she died. And the reason I didn't finish it or try to publish it back there then was because it's got some vulgar stuff in there. And I said, well, it'll hurt. It might hurt my grandsons once they're grown. And then once they became grown in age, meaning like 18 and over, I said, listen, your grandmother has an autobiography she'd like to finish but there's some sinful stuff in there. And each one, I swear to you, said, I don't care, will it make money? Yeah, will you be rich, one said. So I finished it in uh, uh, 2015. What did you do that was so crazy? Well, my husband was a cheating man, always was. And so one day my daughter, my youngest youngest child, Didi, the one that died, she was sick. And I walked all the way, and we were bar hoppers, by the way. This particular day, I walked to the bar, and uh, there he was sitting in the car with his his woman and her children. And I said, listen, Dickie, uh, Dee's sick. I have to go to the doctor. And he said, I'm busy. I said, I need the car. I'm busy. I'm using the car. Oh, you talk about real hatred. Oh, I had some hatred for them, him at that time. And for some reason, I didn't even really dislike the chick that much. You know what I mean? Um, she was messing with my husband, but I, I couldn't stand him at that point. Make a long story short, the following week, I took the car and I hit it. But I hit it a couple of blocks away. Well, he found the car and uh, laughed at me, called me stupid. And I said, mm-hmm, to myself, well... Not the following week, but the next week. I took it. I drove the car all the way across the driver bridge to the city, and I drove that car in a garage. I paid storage for a month, and I got on the bus and came back to Queens, and I was laughing all the way. I was laughing. I was so happy and proud of myself. I really loved that one because it really hurt him because he couldn't find the car. My message is to the woman, love yourself more than anyone. Don't let anyone downgrade you. You see how my husband called me stupid because he found the car? Right away, I'm stupid. Okay. You know, that's an insult. That's what, that was painful. Don't let anybody make you feel that way. I don't care if it's your mother, your father, sister, brother, cousin, best friend. You know, boyfriend, I don't care who it is, you don't let them hurt you like that. Cut them off. Does it mean that you're supposed to think you're better than everybody else? No. But do love yourself more than anybody else. I talk about a lot of stuff, girl. I talk about bar hopping, (laughs) adultery, uh, fornication, abortions. uh, I did all of that stuff. Abortions was my worst, and I hate that more than anything. And that's why I want young women to read this book because I want them not to abort babies. I don't want them to do what I did because God will, he will pay you back. You know what you are? (laughs) 
You are a survivor. I That's am. what you are. I hope it will sell. I already feel accomplished because I finished it and it's published. But I want now, I, it's, it's like I really want women to read this. Well, you told me you've already done one book signing, and you definitely have a lot of valuable insight for women. You'll get this done, Myrna. Just, just keep at it. Joyce Briscoe likes writing daily inspirational messages. She's been doing it forever and got pretty good at it. So she gathered all the little pieces of paper she'd written on over the years and put them together for her book entitled Live, Love, Laugh with God. Joyce. Well, um, I've been writing since junior high, high school, just, you know, writing my feelings and stuff. And um, my friends and, and family members kept saying, you need to write a book, you need to write a book. I'm like, my words aren't that good, you know. And so, you know, they inspired me to write the book. So I went ahead and did it. <laughs> Story, poetry, just writing my feelings, just inspirational messages. Can you read some to me? Um, yeah. Give us a message. Okay. Stay blessed, no stress. Don't take no mess. Give it all to God, and he'll take care of the rest. Nice. Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> Short and sweet, huh? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Give me another one. Your future is greater than your past. If what's in your house God hates, then does God hate the house? That's, that's a thinker. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Some of them are, you know, questions you think about. What's your favorite one? Do you have a favorite one? Oh, no. Mm-mm. No, I don't have a favorite one. Yeah, like, you know, and I always felt I wasn't talented enough or, you know, that my words are just, you know, words. They don't have no meaning behind them. And, you know, and I just, you know, I learned that, you know, they come from God. <clears throat> you know, and so they said, you know, put them in a book. Because I would write the, you know, the daily messages on the, um, on the cell phone to all my friends in the morning. You know, I'd wake up and give them a message. You know, it touches somebody's life that it gives them inspiration to go on, you know, with the day or, you know, your life. You know, sometimes you just feel like, you know, giving up or you need to hear a message. You know what I'm feeling? I'm, I'm seeing greeting cards. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's what that's what I wanted to do when I was younger. I wanted to get into that, you know, because some, some of the greeting cards that they have, you know, are just basic. Right. You know, and I always wanted to do that in my life. But, I, you know, I doubt myself a lot. Hey, well, you're still so, here. Like Anything it. can happen. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, because every year, every year I send a birthday message to my sister. On the telephone, she records them. She just loves them, you know, and every year it's, it's something different, you know. <laughs> well, are you going to keep writing now? Um, yeah, I, well, I always, you know, keep writing. Just ma- a matter of me putting it together and keeping them. Because right. I write on scrap papers, I, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning, I get an inspiration, and I just write it anywhere. So for me, it's organizing it. I would like to like to do another book. In the the book I want to do next would be um all the different poems and writings and stuff that I wrote for like plays and things like that, church functions and stuff. So it's a thought. Can I leave you with one for you go? Would you? Yes. Okay. When life seems to weigh you down, don't put on a frown. Pick up your head and push forward to the crown. All right, Joyce, I'm going to do just that. But first, we got to take a quick commercial break. We are going to be right back. Don't you go anywhere. This is the Page Publishing Book Club. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Then now's the time to call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099 and do it immediately. You see, they're looking for authors of all types of books. And unlike most publishers, Page Publishing will take the time to review most of the books submitted to them. And they'll even give you their feedback. And if they like what they read, Page Publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, the Apple iTunes Store, and other outlets. They'll handle everything. Copyright protection, printing, cover art, publicity, and editing. So if you've written a novel, a children's book, a cookbook, inspirational work, a book of poetry, or biography, and want to get it published, then you need to call Page Publishing and do it immediately. Call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. Your road to 
of fame and fortune could very well start with this simple phone call. For your free author submission kit, call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099. Hey, thanks for coming back to the Page Publishing Book Club. I'm your host, Alice Stockton Rossini. You like to gamble? You like to gamble, Rob? No? All right. Well, a lot of people do. And, you know... Let's face it, it's a gamble getting out of bed in the morning, but people who go to the casinos, they really are trying to beat the odds. And Richard De La Torre believes he can help them with his book entitled, it's in the book, Winning Ways, How to Beat the Casinos. He's a former dealer at the MGM Grand. And uh, my first question to you, Richard, is what makes you an expert? Okay, well, a lot of people claim they're experts. I mean, all I'm trying to say in this book is, most gamblers or players in any game, they have no clue of what they're doing. They'll buy a car and research that or a home, but in, in a in a casino, they'll just walk them, throw their money down on the table and says, how do I play? Well, the casino always has a built-in percentage already. So you need to get those percentages in your favor. Not Not necessarily all of it, but you can cut the house percentage down by understanding the game, like in the game of craps. You tell you tell the player that the percentage for the field bet is 5.56, and they're just looking at you. Or you can tell them, okay, then it's 5 to 4, and they're still looking at you, you know, just staring, and I say, okay. The ratios are 20 ways to lose and 16 ways to win. That ratio never changes. Percentages are based on time. Like on the pass line, it's, four, it's 1.41 percent for the casino but that's based in time so in order to to cut down the house percentage say you place a bet on the pass line they offer they call free odds which in my opinion they're not free because let's say the point becomes 10 and the puck goes to 10 now you're waiting for someone to throw a 10 to make that point which is in the pass line you get paid even odds now the free odds they call it you get paid two to one Yes, you do make more money, but the ratio for the casino is six ways for them to win and three ways for you to win. So it's six to three in the casino's favor. Well, so, Richard, I just what I want to know is what, how do you know this? You know, you want people to buy your book because you're you're calling yourself an expert. You know, how is that? Well, I've been playing craps or in horse racing since 1981. You know, over the years, yes, trial and error. Sure, I've lost. I'm not going to say I won or I don't win all the time. Even though what I know doesn't mean I'm going to win. All I all I all I have is the knowledge of the game and and I understand the percentage for the house or the ratios. Ratios are really important because people understand ratios before percentages. They can care less about the percentages because right. that's the house percentage. You want to know how can I win right now and I tell them. So yes, I've been playing for a long time. I played blackjack Roulette, you can make a few bucks. It's not a game that you can really make money, but I worked out a method, uh, and people ask me, you mean a system? No, it's not a system. It's a method of mathematics. Same thing with the crap table and blackjack. They're all based on numbers. Right. All these games have numbers. You need to find those numbers and cut the house percentage down using those numbers. So that's why I show them how to hedge bet. In, in blackjack, you use card counting. If you don't know how to use card counting or no basic strategy, you shouldn't even be playing blackjack. Why, why should I buy your book? There's so many books. I mean, yes, there's a tons of books. I cut down only what they need to know. I could have made a book five inches thick, but why? Why would you do that? Right. I would like to see people understand what they're doing. They need to understand the ratios and hedge betting and money management. Their profits would be incredibly, it's, it's, I mean, I can tell you story after story of how many people come up to me and then after I show them, they want my book right now. And I said, sorry, I can't do it. I'm dealing right now. You need to do like yeah. seminars, you know. Well, I, the, the casinos, they don't want that. They, no. want, they want dummies and drunks playing their games. They don't right. want smart people, especially blackjack. I always thought card counting was illegal. No, it's not illegal. It's just a uh, practice that the casinos don't like. Once they find out you're a card counter or an advantage player, they'll ask you to leave or play another game. And like I said, they don't like uh, smart players. They want the dummies and the drunks. Yeah. So, so don't be yeah, a dummy I, or a drunk. 
Right. All right, Richard, thank you. A text message. That's how Marlene Smith got started on her first book. It's called A Small Town Zombie Story. So this was a text to your best friend, right? What did it say? Uh, it started off at, at um, like in the book, it started like, you know, it's been, I think it was weeks since the zombie apocalypse started and searching for food and stuff. So that's how it kind of like that. So it was like a joke. Yeah, I just uh, continued with it because everybody thought it was pretty funny. And um, as I worked with him, we just came up with ideas of what to put in the book. He's a pretty funny guy, and he's pretty open. So what he does is he tells you, you know, his fears and, you know, all that stuff. So I was like, you know, that kinda, that's kind of funny. So I put that in there with him, with the, the book and making him scream like a little girl because that's what it says he always does. So he's kind of a, a really funny character in the book. So and it's about um, when the, uh, the zombie apocalypse co- um, comes. He's my brother in the, in the story because he's like a brother to me. And we get together to take our families to safety. And in the process, we, you know, have to fight zombies and other survivors that want the, what we have. And then we take a trip across D.C. to see if there's any more government left and fight some pretty weird survivors. Well, do you just wake and, up one morning in a land of zombies? It, it just uh, starts out as it, it's been months since the zombie virus has been uh, released on the world. And I find myself hunting the undead again. Is this anything like The Walking Dead? Uh, kind of, but um, I think The Walking Dead is probably a little bit better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a small town zombie story. Where's the small town? Here in Myrtle Creek. Okay. I've uh, designed a shirt with uh, my story on it. What's it look like? It's got um, a small town zombie story on the front, and it's got like um, blood splatters and zombie bites. And then on the back, it has uh, the uh, zombie killer 13 with the blood splatters on it, like, like the girl is wearing on the cover of the book and it's the same style it's got the sleeveless thing describe the front cover for me okay the front cover has got the corner of a, a jeep with a girl standing with knives on it, it or in her hands and it has a her, her shirt on there with the zombie killer 13 and then in front of there is the brother with guns headed towards zombies in the town caught on fire Oh my God! Does this series continue, or does it does this book yes, end? Uh, it, I did. I just finished part two to it uh, about a week ago. Oh, okay, so you're going to keep going with this? Yeah, but I also wrote a paranormal book too, or a book on paranormal kind of thing that I'm gonna this month be putting into the editing process to put it out too. Before this, did you ever write? No, no, I didn't. I've always every time I go somewhere, I was good at telling stories or scary stories because that's what I like. I like the horror flicks and stuff, so I was always good at like campfire stories, and everybody liked it. So I was wanted to, but never really got any ideas of what to write. Well, now you know, Marlene. Keep it up. Dennis Stubblefield worked in a logging mill his whole life, so he could take care of his family. And when he retired, he decided it was time to write something he always wanted to do. And his family was the inspiration for Life Through My Eyes. Now, are these stories in poetry form or inspiring messages? Describe your book, Dennis. That's uh, basically what they are. They're poems, short stories, and sayings. And like uh, a short uh, saying would be like uh, the best prescription for a bad day is a good smile. And uh, uh, the best prescription for a broken heart is a mended mind. So you have little sayings, and then you have stories. Are the stories mostly about your family? A lot of them are, yeah. But there's uh, one called The Popcorn Man, The Candy Man. It's about a popcorn man in our town and a candy man. And a lot of it's fictional, but it's just things that came into my mind, and I just write it down, and they came out good. <laughs> uh, here's just one little thing I put in here. To, it's a note to the, my readers. Okay. I hope that this book will be as inspiring to read for you as it was to write for me. It's a good feeling to put on paper what your mind shares with your heart. That's a a note to my readers. That's a heading in the book, you know. That's nice. And so, yeah, I want want to sell it. That's definitely what I had in mind, but I I think it'll be kind of inspirational for anybody to read, and it could have... It could have been written by anyone, too. I mean, it's it's kind of a reference for life. A reference for life. Are you going to keep writing? Well, I do have uh, three more stories that are in uh, review right now with Paige, and uh, one of them is uh, The 
name of it. It's Hot Cops. It's about two police officers that go through uh, the police academy together, and when they come out, they, uh, they're they teamed up in a squad car, and that's basically how that starts. Okay. Another one is Terror in the Air, and it uh, is about a, a man that uh, he gets his pilot's license, and he buys a, an airplane, and he takes his family on a, a flying vacation, and they get in a plane crash, and that's how that one goes. Jeez. And then there's another one that uh, is uh, A World Beyond Time. And that's about a, a one pilot that uh, get, gets out into space and he's uh, doing a space exploration and he gets pulled down on a tractor beam by this planet and meets a little, uh, little some little people and that's how that one goes that's how it starts and, uh, like I said those are under review I don't I don't know if they're going to publish them or not but they're they're uh, looking at them so well there you go at least someone's looking at them alright Dennis thank you and thank you Rob thank you for hanging out with us this evening if you want to do it all over again you can download us anytime you want and listen as much as you want at 710 WOR Dot iHeart.com. In the meantime, would you please start thinking about what that first book is going to be about? Okay, Rob, come on. Let's get moving. We should write a book. We should write a book about what it's like. What it's like. The real story behind Radioland. All right. Even more important than that, have a great weekend. Mm-hmm.